Hi everybody, welcome back. We are in Jeremy Duff, Elements of New Testament Greek. We're on page 117, we're in section 10.3, which is entitled Direct and Indirect Statements. For some reason, people get very confused about this, or some people get very confused about it. In this video and the next video, I'm going to try and sort out all the confusion for you. In this video, then, what we're going to do is focus on what direct statements are, how to construct them. The next video, we'll look at indirect statements. Before we get into that, with the help of this example, let me just uh, point you towards Duff and highlight what a direct statement and what an indirect statement is. There's a great little explanation here, uh, right underneath the... Uh, the heading, section 10.3, in English, a verb of saying, like I say or I speak or something, can be followed either by the words that were said, enclosed in quotation marks, or by the word that, followed by a report of what was said. For example, I said, I'm hungry. Or, I said that I was hungry. The first is a direct statement. It reports directly, so to speak, exactly the words I said. The second is an indirect statement because it reports indirectly on the content or the meaning of what was said. Notice also that it's not just what I say that could be the subject of a direct or an indirect statement, as Duff goes on to point out. He says other verbs of saying or thinking or believing or seeing or hearing could also be involved in direct or indirect statements. So for example, I heard that it was going to rain. I heard that, and then that introduces an indirect statement, a report of what it was that I heard, but an indirect report, because it's not reporting the precise words, is it? Uh, a direct statement by contrast would be, I heard, quotation marks, it's going to rain, end quotation marks. Can you see? So other verbs besides speaking, uh, verbs like I hear, I believe, I fear, uh, I learn, I see, and so on, can also introduce direct or indirect statements. So that's the difference between them. In this video, I'm going to be explaining the four different ways that Greek uses to introduce direct statements. You'll sometimes hear me calling this direct speech, uh, and of course that's the most common kind of direct statement, because it's I said something, but if you hear me saying direct speech, that's nothing different from a direct statement. It's just a direct statement where the verb is a verb of saying, so I'm calling it direct speech. And I'll use that uh, nomenclature because other people do, and it's just good for you to get to hear how people speak about these things. Okay, so to illustrate this, the four different ways of introducing direct statements or direct speech in Greek, we're going to look at John 14:16, uh, which says this. It's precisely there, so there's a textual variant. The hot might not be there. In some manuscripts, it's not there. But, but let's assume it's there because it makes it nice and easy. Okay. Lege auto hot Jesus. Ego amy her hodos kai he aletheia kai he zoe. Lege auto ho Jesus. Ego amy her hodos kai he aletheia kai he zoe. Well, let's just translate this first and see what's going on. Uh, lege auto hot Jesus. So that's he said to him. And then hot Jesus, of course, is the subject of the verb lege. So this means hot Jesus, Jesus, lege says, not said, says. Get it right, Jeffers. He, Jesus says to him. Comma. Um, incidentally, if you see this translated in the past tense, that's perfectly normal and perfectly uh, reasonable because Greek often uses the present tense to narrate past events. I've talked about that in the past. It's a so-called historic use of the present or historic present. Historians use it when they talk about, they use the present tense in English. Uh, Julius Caesar uh, sees his uh, army doing such and such a thing and Seize is a present tense verb, but when they're narrating past actions, they often use present tense verbs. Nothing different from that here. Jesus says to him, quotation marks, ego amy, I am herhodos, the way. Notice, feminine noun, with a feminine article, but looks masculine. Hodos, eremos, iguptos, three 
feminine nouns that look masculine. The way uh, through the desert, eremos, uh, or wilderness, from Egypt. Way, desert, uh, or wilderness, Egypt, the three nouns that are actually feminine but look masculine. And this, of course, is nominative because it's Amy, so it has a complement in the nominative, not an object in the uh, accusative. So I am the way and, oh, come on, you know what these words are, the truth and the life. Close quotes. Uh, just a couple of quirks here. Uh, you probably noticed that a lot of abstract nouns in Greek are feminine. True. Uh, life. Huh, interesting that. Don't know why. Um, also, we're closing the quotation marks there. In Greek, there is no way of indicating uh, explicitly when a quotation ends. And Duff again points that out. Very helpful. Actually, that causes some questions about when Jesus' speech actually ends in John chapter 3, the famous speech following Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus. It's not 100% clear whether the famous John 3.16 was actually uttered by Jesus or whether it's reported uh, as uh, sort of a, a report of the content of what was said by John because it's not clear where the direct speech ends. Interesting that. But anyway, I am the way and the truth and the life full stop. Right. This illustrates one way of introducing direct speech in Greek. Simply using a capital letter. Very, very easy. Now, that isn't the only way of doing it, and you can kind of imagine why. Um, as it happens, as Duff points out, uh, the uh, most, well, many early Greek manuscripts were written entirely in capitals. Um, this would not be an entirely unambiguous way of introducing uh, direct speech in Greek if you're concerned about writing. And of course, uh, if you're concerned about speaking, which is the primary mode of, of, of um, communication in that kind of first century context, there are still other ways in which you can imagine wanting to introduce direct speech. And interestingly, those are reflected in the three other ways in which this sentence could have been written to convey the same meaning. Let me write them out for you, and then you'll see what I mean. I need to find a nice blue pen. Hold on. There we are. Does that work? Yes, it does. Right. The other three ways of introducing direct speech would be as follows. You could just use the word hotty. Hotty. And in this context, hotty is not translated. It just functions a little bit like English quotation marks. So, capital letter or capital letter plus hotty or another alternative let's get rid of that is to say is to use that participle of the verb lego I say um, but that's the, the participle, the nominative singular participle, um, which translates literally as saying. So Jesus says to him, saying, I'm the way and the truth and the life. That sounds a bit awkward, doesn't it? Because says, saying, if we had legone there, probably the way we translate it is to keep saying as the literal translation of legon, but we change it here to something like speaks. Jesus speaks to him saying and so on, because that seems to fit better in English. It sounds more smooth in English. And if you said Jesus says to him saying, well, that's not quite right, because in English uh, to say only introduces the direct content of what is said. It doesn't function in this way um, when uh, you've got an additional verb, like a participle, saying and then uh, introducing what is said. So uh, you learned ages and ages and ages ago that lege, or sorry, lego can mean I speak or I say or I tell. Well, here's why it can mean I speak or I say, right? If it comes in a context where you have legone, then in English, we need to translate legae as he 
speaks, otherwise it just doesn't make sense. So that's why you learned all those months and years ago that Lego means speak, say or tell. Okay, so that's the second option. Remember the first option, just the capital, uh, at the capital letter at the start of the direct speech. Second option, use hotin, capital letter at the start of the direct speech. Third option, saying, and the capital letter at the beginning of the direct speech. And the fourth often option, as you will have guessed, is that one, just to combine these two. Jesus speaks to him, saying, then the little word that's like quotation marks, and then off we go. Couldn't be simpler, could it? Yeah? Don't need to worry, you don't need to panic, and in fact, as you start to see sentences like this more and more, whenever you see a capital letter, and you've probably noticed this already, whenever you see a capital letter, it's actually, oh, it's a bit of a relief, because it's a clue, a very clear clue in English about what's going on. Just a note on what um, uh, Duff points out here. Um, uh, because, as I mentioned a moment or two ago, most, um, many, sorry, early Greek manuscripts only used capital letters, and not all the capital letters either, they missed out letters all over the place. Um, uh, the uh, actual inclusion of a capital letter in our texts is an editorial decision. Uh, the Greek New Testament text that you'll be using is an eclectic text, uh, made from lots and lots of different texts, all um, compared to try and figure out which was most likely to be the original. And in doing that task of compiling the text, the editors have made translational and interpretive judgments to a certain extent, even though they're actually just giving you the Greek text, they're telling you that this is where we think the direct, direct speech begins, if you don't have one of these clues. They're probably right, but just be aware that occasionally some of their decisions are debated. Okay, that will probably do us, I think. I think we've covered all the things in Duff's section there on page 117. Yes, that's good. Right, now next time we're going to come back and we're going to look at indirect statements, indirect speech, and we'll see how they contrast with this. And there's a couple of complexities about indirect statements that we need to get straight, but it won't be too hard. Stick with it. 20 minutes a day, 30 minutes a day, five or six days a week. And we'll have you reading the New Testament in Greek in no time. Okay, God bless you and bye for now.